So we've been reading for a while now from Ram Dass's book. It's called Be Here Now, and it was written in the 70s. Be Here Now, and it's about being present. It's about being present and being here now and not trying to take ourselves to the past or to the future and try to figure out things that really distracts us, actually. It's distracting. So let's see. Um, we read last week about the rational mind. So let me just read this. This is the poet quotes. Uh, right mindfulness snatches the pearl of freedom from the dragon of time. Now that quote comes from the heart of the Buddhist meditation. We are not trying to check the thought waves by smashing the organs which record them. We have, we have to do something much more difficult to unlearn the false identification, the thought waves with the ego sense. This process of unlearning involves a complete transformation of character, a renewal of the mind, as St. Paul put it. Any system of meditation which will produce the power of concentrating the mind on anything whatsoever is indispensable, Tibetan yoga and secret doctrine. There are no impediments to meditation. The very thought of such ob obstacles is the greatest impediment, Rama Maharshi. And then it goes on deeper into the rational mind. So he gives an exercise here that we can um, use to transcend the mind. Does that make sense? To kind of where we're going to try to turn the mind in on itself. So what, what he does is he gives us an exercise to work with. Um, and so he says, one of the techniques used extensively in India was expounded by Ramana Marsh, Marishi and is called Vikhara Adman, who am I? It's my favorite question. Who are we? It is a method for turning the mind in upon itself. The first, no, the first to know, the first know its true nature and then to be its true nature. The method is technically simple, though extremely difficult to execute. Number one, you ask yourself, who am I? Then step by step, in a systematic fashion, you proceed to dissociate yourself from all the elements you previously identified as I. Number two, you answer, I am not my torso or my body. Then you attempt to experience yourself as separate from your body. It is helpful to some people at the onset to place the eye in the middle of the head and then see it as separate from the other parts set forth. Okay, so we'll place the eye in the center of the head or in the mind's eye, whatever you want to say, <coughs> and we'll everything else around that eye that's in the head is different, it's separate. It's not the eye. Number three, then you say, I am not the five organs of motion, the arms, the legs, the tongue, the sphincter, and the genitals. As you say each of these, experience your eye as separate from that part of the body. Number four, then you say, I am not the five organs of sense, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the skin. Again, stop. With each and experience it as, a, as separate from the I. Number five, then say, I am not the five internal organs, the organs of respiration, digestion, excretion, circulation, perspiration. Again, you stop with each of these sets of organs, attempt to experience the organ or to imagine its functioning, and then proceed to experience I as separate from that organ. Number six, if you have carried out the above instructions exactly, the only thing that is left are your thoughts. And thus, the final step is to say, I am not these thoughts. Now, the, the exquisite difficulty at this point is that the thought of I, which you originally placed in the middle of your head, is also a thought, which you are not. So even the thought of I must go it's a little like climbing out on the forest branch of a tree and then cutting, the, cutting off the branch. The inert body does not say I. Reality consciousness does not emerge between the two. 
and limited to the measure of the body, something emerges as I. It is that that it is known as chitta jagrati, the knot between conscious and inert. And also as bondage, soul, subtle body, ego, samsara, mind, and so forth. If you have sufficient discipline of mind to carry this exercise through to completion, you have entered into the realm of sat chit ananda, reality, consciousness, your true self, where there is only one. There's a poet quote, all that is made seems planless to the darkened mind because there are more plans than it looked for. So with the great dance, set your eyes on one movement and it will lead you through all patterns and it will seem to you the master of movement. But the seeming will be true. Let no mouth open to gainsay it. There seems no plan because it is all plan. There seems no sinner because it is all sinner. Blessed be he. Allegiance to void implies denial of voidness. The more you talk about it, the more you think about it, the further from it you go. Stop talking, stop thinking, and there is nothing you will not understand. Return to the root and you will find the meaning, pursue the light and you will lose its source. Look inward and in a flash you will conquer the apparent and the void. Our existence as embodied beings is purely momentary. What are a hundred years in eternity? But if we shatter the chains of egotism and melt into the ocean of humanity, we share its dignity. To feel that we are something is to set up a barrier between God and ourselves. To cease feeling that we are something is to become one with God. That's a quote by Gandhi. Make your will be known. Don't listen with your ears. Listen with your mind. Don't listen with your mind, but listen with your spirit. Listening stops with the ears. The mind stops with recognition. But the spirit is empty and waits on all things. The way gathers in emptiness alone. Emptiness is the fasting of the mind. It is easy to keep from walking. The hard things is to walk without touching the ground. That which sees through the eye, but who the eye sees not. That is the Atman. And remember the Atman is the self. The self is the witness. All pervading, perfect, free, one, consciousness, actionless, not attached to any object, desireless, ever tranquil. It appears through illusion as the world. That's the Ashtavakara Gita, so not the Bhagavad. That the next chapter is time and space. Do you have any questions or comments? No. While you were reading, I was thinking, and then you used I. I was thinking that was the self. Is that, and then at the end, you said self is a bit of a different thing. Mm -hmm. well, what, what, yeah, well, what he's saying is use the letter, like a capital I in the head, to kind of separate your true self with what we've identified with. Okay, not I as an personal pronoun. No, no, I, yeah, and, and, then you, and then you'll let all of that go as well. Okay. So we've been doing this for a long time. Is there anyone who, and I no one asked this, but I hope that y'all listen to the exercise and that you're willing to give that a try. And if you didn't catch what the exercise was, you can always go and listen to the podcast and, and rehear the exercise. So you place the eye in the center of the head, and then from there you start to um, break all of the sense organs down and break your internal organs down and separate yourself from them, which is what we've identified with is our body, right? We've all identified ourselves with our bodies. 
But that's still, I think the point of this exercise is to get us to the point where we understand that that is not our true, that's not true to who we are. That's just our, mm, I think of it as a covering. And I've read someone explain it as, think of it as your clothing. Think of your body as your clothing. You put it on and you take it off. It's not a permanent thing, your clothing. It's just kind of a cover. It's a cover. It's, it's, um, it's a tool that you use to cover, but it's not, it's not, your clothes don't make you who you are, even though some people believe that. Do you know how many kids die over a pair of tennis shoes that really, seriously, Some of us have identified so much with that, that we think that's who we are or that that makes us someone. It makes us who we are. So if we can, if we can find a simple way to start to lose the identification, and that's really what he's talking about, is us losing our identification with all the things that we currently identify with that are not who we really are. <sighs> time and space, you know, that's the next chapter. And he really has some really interesting things to say. We'll read more about this um, next week. But what I, but what I do want to say is he has a few questions, and I just want you all to listen to these questions and maybe ask yourself if, that, if the last exercise that I read was too long, maybe you can do this one. It's a little bit shorter, and, and it's, you can ask yourself these questions. And so, number one, ask yourself, where am I? And the answer is going to be here. And then you ask yourself, what time is it? And then your answer is going to be now. And he says, say it until you can hear it. Say it until you can hear it. <clears throat> say it over and over and over. Those are really simple questions. And it won't take you but a moment to ask yourself, where am I? What time is it? This gives you time and space. Uh, set, al set alarm clocks or designed your day or put up notes or on the wall so that a number of, of times during the day you'll remember to confront yourself with the question, where am I, what time is it? And then for specific periods of time, focus your thoughts in the present. Don't think about the future, just be here now. Don't think about the past. Just be here now. Reflect on the thought that if you are truly here and now, that it is enough. That's hard. Man, that's hard to do. It's a lifetime practice. Can we start with those simple questions to ourselves? You know, it needs to be simple to do. It needs to be simple questions like that that we can remember to ask ourselves yes. during the day. Where am I? What time is it? And I've, I've posed questions to the class before. Who are we? <clears throat> what are we? And what is our purpose? I've been at, we, I think as a, as a group, we've asked ourselves that for a while now, and I don't know that any of us has really come up with the answer. Other than I know that we're not what we thought we were. I know that we're not who we thought we were. I know that we're not the identifications that we've um, identified ourselves with. Even as a culture, guys, even as a, a, Americans, So we got a lot of work to do. 
a lot of work. Okay, so I can like imagine myself like doing that, like asking myself those questions, and I just feel like it wouldn't really help me that much. Like, like I'd be like, oh, I'm here, and it's now, and my mind would go immediately back to like thinking about the past and the future. Mm-hmm. You know? I just feel like I would have to ask myself those questions like constantly. You do. For it to actually do anything. You do. That's why I'm going to practice and practice. You do. It says you would have to do this. Oh, he just says, says, go around your house and put notes to remind yourself to just ask yourself those questions. Now, I always say this, guys. If you ask a question, you will get an answer. It may not be the answer you want. It may not be when you want it. You may not understand the answer. You may never even hear the answer, but, but it will be answered if you just ask. You know, um, I learned this mindfulness, these three mindfulness questions that I use really often. And, and like you just said, I, I've used them so much that they will come up automatically. Uh, not every time that I need them, but they come when they come. And one of them is, the first one is, um, tell me what you're doing as you're gathering evidence to be here right now. And the first one is, I'm aware that I see. And then you look around and where you are and you name what you see. And you name, after you name that maybe one thing, you say, I'm, aw- I'm aware that I'm aware. Mm-hmm. And then you name two more things you see. And every, each time, I'm aware that I'm aware. The second one is, I'm aware that I hear. And so you go through those three, I'm aware that I hear, I'm aware that I'm aware. And then you go, to the third one is, I'm aware that I feel, and it's not about emotion, it's about texture, um, you know, um, cold, hot, you're, you're getting in touch with your body. Mm-hmm. And um, that is just extremely helpful. That's a tool I've used for a while. And it gets me right in the present. Well, let's start to practice those things. I mean, and Vicki is right. It's not like you're going to ask yourself that question and then you're going to remember the answer and then it's just going to be automatic from there on and then, you know, you've got the whole answer to life down. It's not, it really takes a lot of work. And that's what I'm talking about when I say uh, the yoga off the mat. This, this is what real mm-hmm. yoga is. For newbies, for you guys that are new to yoga, Kevin, this is what yoga is about. I love that yoga off the mat. So, I've been doing mindfulness and the pasana meditation and for a while. So that's mm-hmm. well, the, well, the, yes, and that is yoga. So, just different terms, just different practices, mm-hmm. use different, a little bit different terms. Mm-hmm. And I think that we think if we come to exercise that we've completed our yoga and that we don't need to do anything else. But a true yogi has a a lifetime of practice, constant practice, awareness. Just being aware of your own thoughts is is a huge practice because thoughts can come and go real easily, and they do. We just give them free reign. They can do whatever they want to do. They can come in and disturb, and we can accept it and move on. You know, we don't give it any second thought. You know, we don't control the thoughts, or we don't try to um, even notice what we're thinking. But I'll tell you what, your body is reacting to your thoughts. I promise. It's one of the things that helped me lose all that weight was to be mindful and let those thoughts go. Mm -hmm. Release the thoughts. Another hard thing to do. Start your internal dialogue. Start your internal dialogue. I tell you what, it's not going to do, and that's hurt. It's not going to hurt us. I have a question. Yes. Please, Anton, ask away. Why is it detrimental to occasionally think about the past or the future? Well, I, he didn't say that it was detrimental, but what peop, we don't we don't just occasionally think about the past or the future. 
most of us live in either the past or the future and very, very, very rarely and briefly in the present. And that's really the problem. Is it's that the past it's not and the reality. Right. And the past and the future is distracting to the present, which is where we create. We create in the present. And so if we're, if we're always in the future or we're always in the past, then we're not in our place where we can create, which is in the present. That's the only place we can create. So I don't, I don't think that he's saying that it's just going to kill us if we think about the past. But we have to think about the future somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a part of being, you know, having this human experience is you have to think about the future you know, you have to eat and have a place to live and drink water. And you know what I mean? You've got to think about those things. But we don't have to place ourselves in a constant, um, what if this happens in the future? What if that happens in the future? Well, that happened in the past, so it's got to happen in the future. Or do you know? Obsessing about it. Yeah. So, like, overthinking it causes anxiety, stress. Mm -hmm. And I think living in the past, how many of you guys really and seriously have in your life lived in the past? I have done that. And you just can't let go of what, what used to be or what could have been or what should have been or what was not. And you can't let go of that. And so you can't create anything in the future because you're really hanging on to the past. And so I think that if, if, if we take our time, if we take ourselves out of the future and out of the past as much and maybe equal out the time, maybe even the time out, maybe say, okay, if I just, I, I can't make it unless I think about or unless I'm in the past or I'm in the, in the future. So maybe taking ourselves and placing it evenly. Sometimes allowing yourself to do things, even if you know that those things aren't good, allowing until you can kind of break away from them is helpful. Sometimes dropping things right away and saying, oh, I'm just never going to do that anymore, doesn't actually work out. Because it was kind of let go too quick, you know? It's a process. Letting go is a process. It's good to be mindful about the past in the future, but not to worry about it. Mm -hmm. or, or to live by it. Yeah, have it in you. Thich Nhat Hanh calls the present moment the ultimate dimension. The ultimate dimension? Very nice. And I used to be uncomfortable saying that, the ultimate dimension in the, in the Yagata, but at some point it just clicked. It just felt, yeah. I was, I was, feeling um, a little actually scared of, you know, letting go of the habit energy of mm -hmm. past and future. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but then I just got it. It's like, yeah. It's like, I was okay saying ultimate dimension. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's a good one. And whatever two words you can pick to, to keep running through your mind or whatever question you can pick, to keep running through your mind, do so. It's not going to hurt you. Maybe it'll help you. So let's see what I've said. Ram Dass, Be Here Now. The back section of the book, it's called The Sacred Cookbook. And that's where we're reading from. So if you didn't, if you want to re-listen to it, please re-listen. Go to our website, energiesbalance.com, and re-listen Pass it along to everyone. We have to make a change some kind of way sometime soon. And we talk about collective mind. We talked about this last week, the collective mind and our collective consciousness. And if we as a group, just this small group that we are, can add something different, something positive to the collective, to our thought patterns. Because our thoughts are in patterns and we can... We can break those patterns and set new things, but we can do this even as a small group. And once we add to the collective, that information is there and available for everyone to enjoy. Just kidding. Well, yeah, yes, to enjoy, but do you know what I mean? Once we get it, once we have the idea, it's there for everyone to get. I think we've made it a little bit too complicated.